Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very happy to bring the conversation I had with Helen Chersky. Helen is a trained physicist and also currently an oceanographer. Uh, much of her research is on the physics of the ocean surface, and she does much uh, wonderful research at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at University College in London. Uh, as I mentioned, her training is in uh, physics, and that's where she kind of started out wanting to be a physicist. Um, she has her PhD from Cambridge. Uh, upon receiving her uh, PhD, she kind of switched into oceanography, and she has looked at the physics of oceanic bubbles, <laughs> first at University of Southampton and now at University College London. And she's also a science communicator. She's been on many programs with BBC Science and many other places, and she is the author of the very wonderful book, The Blue Machine, How the Ocean Works, and uh, that is what we talk about in this conversation. We start by describing uh, how there's one ocean. Uh, we break it up into these, you know, kind of the Southern Ocean, Pacific, Atlantic, but really it's just the ocean. We talk about why people talk about almost you know they don't focus on the ocean it's always kind of in the background but she focuses just on the ocean and how it works and how it moves and how it's kind of like an engine a machine uh, we talk about the makeup of the ocean its temperature salinity wetness we talk about how much salt is in the ocean layers of the ocean we talk about the mediterranean we talk about how water impacts each other uh, in other parts of the globe the shape of water wind gravity we talk about the moon and ocean tides talk about the ocean floor, the depth of the ocean, and of course, we talk about the impact of climate change on the ocean. You'll have to uh, forgive a little bit of the audio. She was uh, just getting over a cold and, and, uh, and a bit sick, so she was a true champion to, to talk to me for a, a little over an hour while she was trying to get over a cold. Um, that said, uh, I, much as it was with the book uh, in the conversation, I learned so much from the conversation, uh, so much to to still understand about the ocean. She's doing uh, absolutely fantastic work, and um, it really, really is just a, a pleasure to to get all of her knowledge downloaded here. Uh, as always, you can find this conversation and all other conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. You can interact, you can comment, you can share, you can like, follow, contribute. And uh, please do subscribe. You can also subscribe on YouTube as well. Uh, make sure you get her book. Uh, now I bring you Helen Tursky. I am here with Helen Tursky. Helen, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm greatly looking forward to speaking with you. Thanks for having me along and apologies for my slightly scratchy voice. Uh, no, no, you're fine. I appreciate you uh, powering through, even if you're feeling a little under the weather. I, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, I'm very, very excited to talk with you about your wonderful book. Uh, I could not put this down when I read it. It was very, very informative. It was very good. It's great writing. It's called The Blue Machine, How the Ocean Works. And I cannot recall reading a book on the ocean kind of like specifically, like how it works and all of the details of it. I have known some things about the ocean or have seen it in documentaries, but actually having a book on the ocean was pretty badass. So it's a, it's a great book. Um, before we get into it, why don't you tell listeners uh, who you are uh, professionally, academically, and uh, what you're currently up to? Uh, I'm an associate professor at University College London, and I, I, I'm a bit hard to label for lots of reasons. One of them is that I'm a physicist studying the ocean in a mechanical engineering department, which sort of makes sense if you believe in fluid mechanics, but it doesn't make sense from the outside world. <laughs> um, so, you know, I spend my sort of day job is studying the surface of the ocean, breaking waves and bubbles, and uh, because they help the ocean breathe mostly and for various, they, they do various other things. Um, so I do experiments in the lab to study bubbles, and I mostly these days go out to sea and... Um, out into quite stormy water in extreme environments and study the bubbles out there. Hmm. Um, yeah, and then I, you know, I write and talk about science, share science alongside that. And it's, it's I think, you know, the important importance of the dialogue of, between science scientists and society is very important. I think so. So I do quite a bit of that. That's that's wonderful. You have such a cool job. Um, let me ask. I, I'm just curious. Have you been to? You've been to all five oceans. Um. 
I, so we don't tend to think of it like that. I have, yeah. So I have worked in the Arctic Ocean and been to the North Pole. I've worked in the Pacific and the Atlantic. I've probably, I've been, and I've, and I've crossed the Southern Ocean. I've, pro, I've not been, I've not gone very far into the Indian Ocean. So that would be where the gap is. I haven't been at sea in the Indian Ocean. Interesting. But the other major ocean basins I have spent quite a lot of time in, yes. Mm, that's, but when you're an oceanographer, you know, you don't sort of split it up like that. I mean, it's, it's interesting that, so... You know, just before we started, we were discussing the map that's on the front of the UK mm -hmm. uh, book, which is kind of an unwrapped map of the ocean. Um, you know, because to, to put a to put a, a spherical set of shapes onto a flat map, you have to kind of do some unwrapping and some distortion. And what we always do is we cut the ocean in, so that we can see the land. Mm. Um, and if you do that, then you're always thinking about the land. So you, then the ocean is just a bit between the land, and then. It, you kind of split it into the bit that's between the Americas and Europe and that's the Atlantic and you split it, you know, you sort of, yeah. whereas actually when you unwrap it the way it's unwrapped on the book, which is called the Spillhouse Projection, you can see the whole thing as one big connected mm. body. So, so there are sort of some characteristic differences between those, the bits, if you like, but they are actually all connected. So it's one global ocean. Mm. So oceanographers tend to get a bit confused if you ask them, mm. like I just did. Like, have I been to all the oceans? You're like, well, I've been to the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> just some different bits of it, well, you know. Why, why do we, why, because I was, when I was a kid, I learned that there were four and then somewhere they made the Southern Ocean a thing. But I mean, your point is well taken is there's the ocean and then, you know, but why do we, why do we split it? Is it literally just a land thing? Why do we split between four or five oceans? So, well, so, I mean, Spillhouse said something quite profound when he made that map. Actually, he said in order to see the land, we always split the ocean. And so in order to see the ocean, we must split the land. And I think it, if you split the ocean, which is what we do to draw our maps, you kind of need to know that this bit of the ocean on this side is the one that joins up in the same, you know, it's the same ocean on the other side. So you've kind of got to give it that name. Mm. And it is true you've got big ocean basins. So, you know, um, the, the ocean basins are the kind of really deep bits of the ocean that have a mostly a relatively flattish floor, sort of about four kilometers deep. And they, they fill in the space between the major continents. Mm. And so, you know, the Pacific is enormous. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's a massive ocean basin. And so it, it does make sense to say it's a bit different from the Atlantic, but both of them are really offshoots of the Southern Ocean, which is the bit that connects everything together. Mm. So the Southern Ocean is the bit that goes round and round Antarctica. And that's kind of the, the, the junction box. Mm. And all the other oceans kind of branch off of that in a way. And mm. the Southern Ocean is what connects them all together. Mm. So it becomes a bit difficult because what's the boundary of an ocean? You know, or a sea, you yeah. know, the Sargasso Sea has no land boundaries. It's this place in the middle of the North Atlantic, slightly to the west of the North Atlantic. And, and it's a sea and it's kind of different to what's around it, but there's no, there's no wall, you know, mm -hmm. there's no wall mm -hmm. of land. Mm -hmm. So... It becomes a bit difficult, but it is useful to, mm. as a general descriptive thing. Mm. Yeah, it's super fascinating. So I guess the, one of the initial questions I had was, I think I certainly have in some ways, we, we kind of take for granted the oceans of the world, uh, or the ocean, I should say now. Um, so much of the earth is water. Um, why do you think for average, you know, people like myself that, you know, aren't in this world, I don't, I'm not a, uh, someone that studies the ocean, um, why do you think we don't, as humans, think a lot or enough about the blue machine, as you call it, as much as we should? And, and why do you use a kind of uh, engine metaphor of sorts to describe the ocean? Well, there is this weird thing that, you know, the Apollo, there's only one time humans have been far enough away to actually see the planet. And that was during the Apollo missions, you know, 1968 and 72. And since then, we've had lots of satellites far enough away to send us pictures, but that was the only time humans could look back and really see the planet. And that was where the, the famous photo came from, that there were two, Earthrise and the blue marble. And it was so obvious from space. It was so obvious. This is blue. And so we've talked about ourselves as a blue planet for 50 years. And, and as you say, we've never really talked about the blue. And it's really interesting because we have all these documentaries about blue planets, and yet we're never, ever... <laughs> talking about the blue, what we're talking about is the things in it, mm. the fish and the whales and the pollution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and somehow that's made us invisible. It made the water itself invisible as though it's only ever there as a background, which is a massive, you know, it's a sort of misconception. And I think there's a few reasons for it. One of them, so, so the great tragedy of the ocean basically is that 
uh, from a human, you know, from a human point of view, the great tragedy of the ocean is that it's not very transparent to light, which sounds silly because we think, you know, if you hold up a glass of water, then light goes straight through it. You can see what's on the other side. Mm -hmm. But actually, light absor uh, water absorbs light quite quickly. So if you shine light into the ocean, it doesn't go very far, mm. maybe 200 meters on a good day. And the reason that matters is that you can't kind of shine a big searchlight down into the ocean and illuminate a great big vista, um, which is what we do with like mountains. You know, if you look at a great mountain range, you see this great vista, you have a sense of its scale. If we look up at a moon, the moon, you know, we've got a sense of its scale. We've got a sense of the cosmos. Um, and we're very visual creatures. And so this, the fact that the physics of the situation stops us from looking down into the ocean in the same way as we look up into the sky. I think, I think that's where it starts because it makes it become unknowable mm. in a way. It's just down there. We can't tell the difference. And the other reason I think that we don't really talk about it is that um, apart from some very obvious things like whether water is liquid or ice, for example, mm -hmm. seawater mostly looks very similar to us. I mean, you know, it might be a bit browny or a bit greeny depending on what's growing in it. But if you're in a boat on top of it, it's water and then there's some more water and then there's some other water. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that there's anything to look at or anything to, to see, any, any sort of subtleties or intricacies is quite hard to appreciate because you're like, well, here's some water and over there there's some more water and it's just more and more and more water. So I think it, it doesn't encourage a human to, to think about the shape of it, the internal anatomy of it, because it all just looks the same. And then, of course, you know, we're land mammals. We are limited in, mm -hmm. in how far we can go down into the ocean. So it, it doesn't, it's not easy for us to go and explore and look around. So it's really interesting, I think, that we've defined ourselves as a blue planet and then completely mm -hmm. stopped thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And the point we're at now is we cannot afford that luxury anymore. Mm -hmm. we, we, if, and if we do think about it, actually, there's, there's been a tendency in you know, certainly Western culture, to treat it as a nice, convenient void. You know, people, are, people stand on the coast and they dip their toes in the sea and they look out over the vastness of the sea and they talk about, you know, infinities and the sort of, you know, the sort of awe, awe associated with this big, vast thing. And it's kind of a convenient void. Mm. It's, and it's better than space in that sense because you can actually put your toes in. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a touch. It's like touching the void. Um, but... But it's, you know, we don't have to, um, it's, 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 a, it's a nice idea. People like that idea. People actually like mysteries. And the problem is if you treat the ocean as a big empty mystery, first of all, you're missing most of the point. But also in our current state of affairs, we need to understand that this is part of our life support system. We can't just treat it as a big invisible thing. We have to actually look at it and see it for what it really is. However beautiful artistically, it might be to consider it as a void. It is far more beautiful and far more important if we consider it uh, as an engine. And then that, you know, to answer that part of your question, the reason I talk about it as an engine is because that's exactly what it is. It's um, the definition of an engine is something that turns heat energy into movement. And that is exactly what the ocean does. It takes in the sun's energy at the top and sometimes indirectly via the wind. And this is an engine that turns. It's got internal anatomy. And that anatomy, you know, it's, it's, it's not all mixed up. It's not just a big pond that's all the same everywhere. It's got components that are moving over each other and around each other. And, and it is an engine driven by energy from the sun. And the shape of that engine and the way it turns dictates everything that happens mm. on our planet, almost everything. And so a lot of things make a lot more sense once you see it like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because it's water and more water, we, we've never really had, mm. never really been encouraged to think about it like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a uh, there's such a I don't know this mighty power of the ocean that is uh, is a vastness, but there's this awe, and I think there's an awe of the ocean in a positive and negative way. There's a there's an awe of a fearing the ocean, and then there's an awe of this wonder and of the the majesty of the ocean. It's 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 kind of it's all of these things. It's almost too big, right? It's almost we, we can't kind of to your point. It's not it's not tangible. It's not concrete enough. And yes, at the same time, you know, we can put our feet in the, in, in the water and say, well, we're, we're in the ocean of sorts. And so, or if you're, you know, off, off at sea and you, you go in the ocean. So it's, it's an interesting kind of uh, paradox of sorts, I guess, that you're, you're illuminating there. <laughs> but then we manage it with other things, you know, yeah. that we, we're quite used to the idea of ourselves and our body being quite complicated. And we can think of ourselves not just as, being the sort of diagram that kids have 
you know, you learn in school that you've got kidneys and a liver and some lungs mm-hmm. and all that kind of mm-hmm. thing, that we actually have cells that are doing really interesting things. And we have, you know, all these things in, for, you know, mechanically inside us that are doing quite intricate things. You know, even if you look at, I don't know, if you go into a chemist or some a pharmacist and you look at skincare products, they're all talking about cells, mm-hmm. you know, that there's this sort of awareness that there is machinery in there doing things. And of course, our brain, we understand this is very complicated. It's very intricate it's doing things. And so we can look at a human and we can somehow get on board with the idea that this is both, you know, a skeleton carrying some meat that's walking around mm. and also the most brilliant and complicated and fascinating thing we know of in the universe, mm. you know? And so I think it's, it's not that we can't do it. It's just that it takes a while to get into it. Mm. And I think a lot of the difficulty with the ocean is, is as you said, you know, there are lots of ways of looking at it. And, you know, there's that, there's that ancient story of the three blind men and the elephant where three blind men, for some reason, come across an elephant and one reaches out their hand and touches the trunk mm-hmm. and says, oh, an elephant's like a snake. One touches the leg and says, oh, well, it's like a tree. And the thing is, they're all true, but they're all partial truths. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so if you're on the edge of a massive great big ocean and you can't see all of it and you can't see into it and you don't really go across it, you're only, you're, you've, all you've got are these partial pictures and they don't add up to anything that makes any sense. You kind of need a critical mass mm. of these stories told from different directions and different angles and for different reasons that tell the fast and the slow and the big and the small and the animals and the humans and all that. And then you start to see what it is. And so, so that's what the book does. Basically, it's, it's, um, it's a collection of perspectives mm. that hopefully leave you with a picture of what, a, a less partial, shall we say, mm. picture of what the ocean really is. Mm. Well, it certainly did for, it certainly <laughs> did for me when, when, when reading it. So it was, it was, again, very illuminating for me. So maybe let's talk about the, the makeup of the ocean, you know, what is the, the, the nature of it? Um, you talk about temperature, um, salinity, and the wetness of water. These sound like things we just, again, yeah, water's wet or, you know, yeah, there's a temperature, it's cold or hot or, you know, there, there's salt in the ocean. Like, but these are things we kind of know and we sort of, at least, at least for me, I take for granted, but why are those the pieces or the components and, and how are they each important for how we understand the ocean? Well, they matter because they do things. And I think, you know, as a physicist, this is something that obviously this is part of how I see the world, but, you know, things happen for reasons. And that um, if, if water is moving somewhere, it isn't just, doesn't, doesn't, it's not, doesn't just feel like it's going for, like going for a walk. You know, it doesn't wake up one morning and go, I think I'll go for a walk today. That's not the way physics works, right? It's driven there by the forces of nature. And, And the question you have to ask is, where are these patterns coming from? There are these big systematic patterns in how the ocean moves. And so um, the anatomy of the ocean is largely, you know, sort of driven by a few things. And as you said, temperature and salinity are, are, are kind of an interesting pair because they set the density of the water. But the other thing temperature does is it tells you how much energy is in the water, mm. which is, so what that says to you is that warm water is carrying energy. Mm. You can't have empty warm water in that says if it's warm it's carrying energy so so um and you know warmer water tends to be less dense it's buoyant so it floats on top of uh, cold water generally and then salt is interesting because you know we all know we say oh yes the ocean is salty but the ocean is tremendously salty if you had to you know i sort of do this in, a, in my lab right because i have to make water that's as salty as the ocean if you've got a tank of water and you have to make it salty you're ladling salt in there for a long time mm. um so you know if you've got an average you know, household bath you have to put a bucket of salt in it mm. to make it as salty as the ocean mm. and the thing that is interesting about that is that life i mean well of course you know salt it's a rock mm-hmm. right so you're kind of putting rock into <laughs> liquid uh-huh. and it makes it more dense mm-hmm. So saltier water tends to sink. So then you've got two things. You've got um, warmth and fresher water, which tends to be buoyant, and you've got cold and dense, cold and salty water that tends to sink down. Um, and the salt brings up, you know, both of those bring a whole load of other questions about life but and how life survives in it. Um, and then you've got the wetness, like the weirdness of water. Water is thoroughly odd, mm. thoroughly weird molecule. There's nothing else quite like it. It's a very small molecule. It should be a gas, basically. Mm. And it isn't a gas because of the, the bonding between, you know, hydrogen bonds are so strong that it it, it sort of it pulls itself together into a liquid. And, and that's why we have liquid oceans made of water and not made of methane or made of ethane or, any, you know, mm. any of these other things that are hanging around. 
Um, and so because it's a liquid, and liquid is quite rare. You know, if you look out in the solar system, liquid is a rare state of being mm. because it has to be right, it has to be sit right in this kind of Goldilocks layer. Mm -hmm. But that allows things to swirl. And it means that your engine is not just, you know, what we think of as a steam engine where a piston pushes on a, a you know, a cam and that turns a wheel and that turns something else. You can follow the chain. A liquid engine is a bit different because in a liquid engine, lots of these patterns can happen on top of each other all at the same time. Mm. You have the really big slow ones, um, which kind of set the background. And then you've got all these little fast processes that happen on top. And it's all true at the same time, depending on, it's like if you look down, a t you know, look sort of down a microscope and seeing different things, depending on how far you zoom in. Mm. Um, so these are, the, these are the constraints that set the ocean. And the reason that the whole thing isn't just mixed up is that basically it's too big. Um, it's actually really hard to mix water up, which sounds weird because, you know, we have a spoon and a teacup and we do it all the time. Mm. But as you, as, as containers of water get bigger, um, it gets harder to mix it up. So if you imagine, you know, most people have probably run a bath at some point and then you decide the temperature's a bit wrong, so you put in some more hot or cold water at the other end. If you don't do anything, it will sit. The, you know, the temperature of the two ends will be different for quite a while before it mixes in. And that's just in your bath. So what you do to mix it up in your bath is you you basically add energy by stirring. That's what you're mm. doing. Mm. Energy that will mix it up. So you have to put in some energy to get the mixing to happen. Um, and, you know, to some extent in a bath, it will happen by itself. But um, in the ocean, it's just too big. There's too much ocean and there isn't enough mixing energy. Mm. So then you get these sort of layers and areas that are separate that have different characteristics. And that's what gives you the anatomy. Mm. <coughs> how, how much salt is in the ocean uh, and, and can we really measure that and, and how how does it continue to to survive obviously there's you're, you're talking about this idea of, of um, temperature and, and if it's warmer there's there's energy that's pushing it but what is that kind of connection between salt and motion and density and and, and how much is in is on the planet is, is in the ocean on the planet well I guess the interesting thing about salt in the ocean is that although it's really important it's not the salt moving that's the important bit. It's the water moving around the salt. Because if you have, you know, the Mediterranean, for example, is a really, um, it's an inland sea. It's got a very narrow neck at the Strait of Gibraltar. Um, the Mediterranean is, is really warm and really salty. And the reason it's warm and salty is that it's the Mediterranean, right? It's really warm. So loads of water evaporates and the salt gets left behind. But then you also, because it's kind of dry, you don't get much rain from the rivers filling in, you know, replacing the water that's lost. So... <laughs> the salt in the Mediterranean hasn't really gone anywhere, but the water's gone away. So you get salty water. And the opposite happens in the Baltic, um, mm. where you get huge amount of river inflow and not much ocean inflow. So in a way, the salt is about, the saltiness of water is about the water coming and going. The salt's just sitting there. Mm. And the salt originally came from... Um, so salt in the ocean is actually, it's not just, we think of table salt as sodium chloride. That's what we're all taught at school. Mm -hmm. But actually ocean salt has a, it's, it's mostly sodium and chloride, but it's also got, you know, magnesium and iodides and all kinds of other bits and pieces in there, potassium. And so um, it's a mixture of things. And it came from uh, both uh, in, on the early earth, acid rain running over the rocks on land and kind of dissolving away bits and washing them into the ocean. Mm. And also underwater volcanoes belching stuff upwards. Mm. So those put, those put the components of salt in and then you've got salt and there it sits. And when it comes to the amount of it that there is, I can't remember the exact number, but I think if you evaporated the whole ocean, which is on average nearly four kilometers deep, you've evaporated away all the water, you'd be left with a layer of salt that's about 64 meters deep from memory. Wow. There's a huge, colossal wow. amount of rock salt mm. that is just sitting there and it's mixed in with the water. And, and then the re part of the reason it matters is that with you can then manipulate the density of water. So some water evaporates, for example, mm. um, whatever's left is saltier. If you take, take water out, basically, mm -hmm. either by ice formation or by evaporation, whatever's left is, becomes dense and then it tends to move downwards. Mm. Um, and so then you start, so then what, what kind of salt, what the, if you can, if there are other processes that change the saltiness, then you change where water sits. And that's one of the things that turns the engine. Hmm. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so if you ask an oceanographer, you know, the first thing they want to know, if, we, if we, we've got these uh, workhorse devices that are called CTDs that 
have, you know, they have totally been the workhorse of physical oceanography for um, 50 or maybe 70 years now, there were various iterations, but, but it's a kind of, uh, they're kind of, they're bottles, they're quite clever bottles that are a bit like a tube and they've got a, a lid on both ends and the lid is open and you lower this down from the side of a ship and it goes all the way down. And, and as it goes, you measure temperature and salinity. And what you see is these relatively sharp jumps. You know, you get a warmer, uh, fresher layer at the top over most of the ocean. And then you suddenly see it, it starts to change and the next layer is different. And the next, and you keep going down all the way to the bottom. And then these systems are set up. So once you've got your picture of where all the layers are, then on the way up, you've got all these bottles and you can choose whether to, when to close the lids. Hmm. So then you take water samples mm. from all of those different things, all of those different layers, and you can bring them to the top and, and sample exactly what's going on. And so this was how we built up our internal picture of the ocean over decades, ships going out, dangling things over the side. Mm. Um, and now there are some automated systems that have sped that up a bit. But the, the problem is that to measure the temperature and salinity of water, you've got to be touching it. Mm. And the ocean's very big, <laughs> so it took us a long time. Um, but we are, you know, we're getting better at it now. But that's the fundamental thing that sets what's going on in the ocean is, is the combination of temperature and salinity. Hmm. It's, very, it's, very, <laughs> it's very interesting how we have, you know, all of these different ways of, of now trying to understand the ocean. And I'm sure there's a, I'm, I'm positive there's a history of how this came about. But in talking, you talk about it in the book, I can't recall if you, you go through all of it, but there's, the ocean is again. It's 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 deep in, in many in many places. Um, you talk about the kind of the the thin layer of the ocean, kind of at the top that we see, and then all the way down there's the ocean floor, and there are um, uh, what are they called? Um, uh, layers. There's all the different layers. They have all of these really long names to them. Uh, I'm sure you know all, all the, the layers of the ocean, I guess. Depends where you are on the planet, actually. Uh, but yes, they, they have different la different layers in different places. Yeah. How does that work? How do we have the top layer and the thin layer and then all the way down, uh, again, at different parts of the, of the planet, you know, uh, the, the ocean floor and all the layers in between? Obviously, that's a system that, that we've created for, I'm assuming, for various reasons. But could you describe what kind of the top, bottom, middle layers and how it works, I guess, for, with the ocean? Well, let's pick a place, the North Atlantic, because it's, a, it's an easy place to, to look at some of this. Mm -hmm. and, and the point is that none of these layers are static. Mm -hmm. they're, they're almost all moving. And the top is generally moving fastest because it's being pushed about by the wind. So, you know, there's all motion, the way water moves in the ocean is almost always sideways. Mm. It's very rarely up and down because once it's at the right density, it's like those posh cocktails, right, where they've got all ridiculous number mm -hmm. of layers of stuff mm -hmm. and it just kind of sits there. <laughs> so if you're in that layer, it's quite easy. If you, there's no energy cost to moving sideways. You just need something to push you along a bit. Mm. But to go up or down, that requires, that's difficult. Mm. Uh, that requires change. So, so things, most movement in the ocean is sideways, mm. um, except for a very small number of places where you get up and down. Mm. So in the North Atlantic, for example, um, there's this layer at the top, which is really interesting. So we, we show maps of surface ocean temperature quite often, you know, and they're red near the tropics because that's where the warm water is around 30 degrees C and they're cold near the poles, maybe minus one degree C, depending on where you are, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's got all these interesting patterns in it. It's not, doesn't just go with latitude. You know, it, it, there are kind of swirls and stripes and bits that are in the wrong place. And, and that's quite interesting all by itself. But that surf, that really is just the surface. <laughs> so over the, the surface of the ocean, um, that's where the sun can get to. Because the um, ocean is not very transparent to light, the sunlight gets absorbed, but it doesn't just vanish. That energy goes into the water and the form it takes is heat. So when sunlight is absorbed, it heats up the surface, which sounds, you know, sort of obvious when you think about it. Mm -hmm. But what it means is that... Um, that warm layer becomes buoyant. And so it sits there. It, it might get pushed by the wind and that will mix it up a little bit. So we call it the mixed layer. There's this buoyant, warm layer on the surface. And it, depending on where you are, it might be, might be 50, sometimes 100 meters deep. It depends on where you are in the ocean. But it's quite different to what's below because it's being warmed by the sun, it's being mixed by the wind and it's being pushed around sideways a bit. Um, and then below that, um, <laughs> depends on where you are. So in the North Atlantic, for example, oh. there is the biggest waterfall in the world is just between Iceland and Greenland. Oh. And 
uh, basically there's a massive great big pool of very, very cold water on the Arctic side and there's a kind of lip. So there's a deep basin on the Arctic side. The Atlantic is very deep and in between there's this kind of ridge um, that almost comes up to the surface to within a couple of hundred meters of the surface, I think. And basically the water at the the top is very cold because it's at the Arctic. It's losing heat all the time. Mm -hmm. It's really cold, so it's really dense. So where it comes up to that lip, it spills over the top and down the other side. Mm. And it will fall down that mountain range three kilometers, three and a half kilometers Mm. to reach the bottom because it's very cold. It's salty and it's very, very cold. So it's dense. So it goes all the way down to the bottom. So that forms North Atlantic deep water. So there's a layer that is just that and it kind of slithers southwards. And then in between, you've got layers that have actually (coughs) come intermediate waters that have come from other places Mm. um, that are sort of filling in the gaps in between. Mm. Um, And so, you know, in the middle of the Atlantic, some of that comes from the Mediterranean, that warm, salty water that I was talking about, that kind of pours out, but then it sits in the middle because it's warm and salty. So it kind of finds a place that's, you know, below the... the, um, warmest stuff above and it's above the cold stuff below and it kind of finds its place and, and moves outwards. So so water masses kind of come in and find the right depth for them and then they kind of slither along. Mm. Um, and the layers below are much thicker. So the, the surface mixed layer is quite shallow because that's set by sunlight mm. and, and everything else is much deeper. Mm. Um, and it sets and it, it matters, you know, so there's a story I tell in the book about uh, a Greenland shark, which is a polar animal, completely bonkers creature. You know, it's a baggy jumper pretending to be a shark. Really. It's kind of got loose skin and it <laughs> it swims at centimeters per second. It's incredibly slow. Um, most of them are blind because they've got worms in their eyes. And they sort of, you know, slide along in complete darkness in the Arctic. And I don't think anyone's ever seen one actually catch something, but if they eat, that you find them in their, in their stomachs, there are seals and fish that can definitely swim faster than a centimetre per second. So the implication is that this thing just kind of slid up behind them mm. and then was quick enough and they just never saw it coming, which is quite a grim image yeah. anyway. Mm-hmm. But they're also the longest lived animals um, like known o- on the planet. Over they're 400 thought to years, right? 450 years yeah. old, yeah. They don't reach sexual maturity until they're 150. That's so you've got wow. these quite strange creatures that can live for so long because it's so cold. Mm. Um, so, you know, of course, it sounds obvious they live in the polar regions. And yet in 2013, I think, um, <clears throat> during um, a set of surveys that were looking to see how the ecology had been changed by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, a group of scientists on a ship put down some hooks, pulled them up, pulled up a, a juvenile Greenland shark. Mm. And the reason they weren't that surprised, it was a bit unusual. And, you know, the surface water was 28 degrees C, far too hot mm. for one of these creatures. Mm. But down below where they pulled it up from, it was four degrees C. Mm. Mm. So, you know, it was a bit out. It would have been having a bit of a tough time, but it wasn't completely out of its, you know, temperature comfort range because down below it's really cold. Mm. So this is what you see if you put well down one of these instruments that measures temperature and salinity, you can see quite big changes mm in the layers. It's real. It's not like tiny little changes, although it can be. They're quite, they can be quite chunky. Mm, mm. You you (coughs) mentioned the, the, the Mediterranean, um, a a few times. I I could be wrong on this. The Mediterranean in terms of where it's located in the shape is, uh, this might, might, might not be the right word, but a, a type of vestige of a, an ancient ocean that isn't there anymore. Is this right? Where the earth has well, shifted in, in many ways. It's had a bit of a mixed history, the Mediterranean. It's very ge- geologically complicated. Mm. Geologists love going there because <laughs> it's got all these kind of crunched up bits. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I don't know all of the history, the geological history of the Mediterranean off the top of my head. I do think that you're right, that there was some, a long way back, there was something mm-hmm. there that was then pushed close. But the more interesting bit, I think, is actually that... <clears throat> um, this very deep hole Mm. formed, basically. Um, But because, you know, it it was closed off from the sea, water evaporated away. So there was just a deep hole. Mm. And then along came what was called the Zanklian flood, Mm -hmm. um, which maybe maybe 50,000 years ago, I can't remember the numbers, where basically the the wall to the Mediterranean was breached and the uh, the wall to the Atlantic was breached. And so it was a completely dry hole. And then Mm. here comes the Atlantic Mm. kind of pouring in, fills the whole thing up like a bath. 
Um, but then the you know the en- the entrance at the Strait of Gibraltar is I think it's fourteen kilometers across. It's really small, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and it's really shallow. Mm. So you've got this great ocean base, you know, this great sort of sea behind it that nearly wasn't there. Mm-hmm, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, so so all of these places, you know, and it, a lot of the, one of the things about all of this, and there is a, a lot of people do study this, is that um, the way the ocean is is kind of set by the land a lot of the time because the land gets in the way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If if this planet was entirely ocean, if it was just completely covered in ocean, actually it'd be quite a boring ocean mm. because you know the the way the water got pushed would be relatively simple, and it would just you know it would do relatively simple things. Whereas you put all this land in the way, all these crinkly bits with awkward shapes. Mm-hmm. And suddenly the ocean can't just go that way. It's got to, you know, spin around and gets pushed off somewhere and something interesting happens. Um, And so people do, and because, you know, the continents of Earth have moved around quite a lot over Earth's history, oceanography has changed huge amounts during Earth's history. And people do study this. You know, I just said that now the deep ocean is, is generally around four degrees C over large, huge areas, the really deep stuff. But that wasn't true through all of Earth's history. You know, there have been periods when it's been as warm as 15 mm. um, because it has been mixed up. So, so this engine can move in lots of different ways, but the way it moves now is set by where the continents are now and uh, the amount of energy that's coming in from the sun mm. now and, you know, some other bits and pieces. So, and, you know, of course, people who are looking at o- o- oceans on other planets are really interested in this because <clears throat> the, the, the layering in our ocean today mostly is set by temperature. Mm. Salt does matter. But on, you know, if you, people looking at uh, the oceans that might be on Titan or Europa, there they think the oceans might be set by salinity. So you've got a very mm. different type of ocean. Mm. Same parameters. It's temperature and salinity. It's just the outcomes are very different. Mm. So, yeah, it, it's not only about what the ocean is today. It's that this is an engine that could run in lots of ways. Mm. And what we get is the, you know, it's provided a wonderful environment for life. I, something I've been I've been thinking about as you've been you've been saying this is that you've you've talked about um, you know the the ocean, and I, I'm curious how does I think for for some people it might be important to kind of hear this is what is the the impact that happens let's say in the North Atlantic, how does that impact eventually the Indian Ocean or how does that impact other bodies of water such as you know, the, the, the Black Sea or the Mediterranean or the Caspian Sea or things like that. How does eventually, because it's all connected, of source of the, the ocean, how does something that's happening in one part of the ocean on the other side of the globe impact uh, whether, you know, um, uh, at some point or more recently, another part of the ocean? How does it all, what's the impact there, I guess, of how they're connected? So there's, there's two... I guess there's two timescales for the answer to that. And one of them is that, you know, if you have even very slow currents flowing, eventually they will get somewhere else and they will carry things with them, nutrients and heat and, you know, whatever chemistry they've got. But actually (coughs) the quicker route for that to happen is that the atmosphere is the uh, speedy conveyor belt that carries a lot of carry. It doesn't carry very much heat, for example. It doesn't carry very much of anything. It doesn't carry very much energy compared with the ocean. But what it does do is move it really quickly. Mm. So um, if there's an El Nino, for example, as we see just starting in the Pacific at the moment, we know the surface ocean temperature in the Pacific is going to increase. Mm. Um, And what that does is it makes a lot more energy available to the atmosphere. So then you've got energy and water going into the atmosphere and they can very quickly move across a planet effectively. Mm. So it's, and it's not that the same water would go all the way there, but you're, you, that, so the atmosphere moves, thing, moves energy very quickly. Mm. Mm. The ocean is a big store of energy that shunts it around very slowly. So in terms of <laughs> how one part of the ocean affects another part, a lot of that is mediated by the atmosphere. Because if you evaporate water from the surface and it goes up into the atmosphere, it doesn't just take water molecules, it takes energy. And when it condenses to form a cloud, it releases that energy, warming the atmosphere up. And then if that air moves, you know, the the sort of the water and the heat energy move around and that will affect physically what happens somewhere else. Mm. So, so it's not, so that's when you get to the whole planet being connected, that you've got these five systems, the, um, the, the oceans, the atmosphere, biology, the rocks and the ice that all interact with each other. And then, 
the ocean by itself does a lot of things, but then it's some of its um, interactions with other parts of the globe are kind of mediated, especially by the atmosphere, because it can move move energy so quickly. Mm. So it's a bit of a mixture of things. Um, mm. And there are some quite strange, you know, these connections also, and they matter a lot on land. So, you know, when I was at school, I was taught about, um, there was a, uh, you know, I don't know, class or set of classes on ancient Egypt. And we learned about the pyramids and Tutankhamun and all of that. Mm -hmm. And what we learned was, you know, that they could have all these luxurious goods because every year there was an inundation and the Nile flooded. And then, you know, there was rich, fertile soil. And then that gave them so much food that they had time to go around making pyramids and, you know, mummifying cats and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. And um, no one ever said, where did the water come from? <laughs> right? That was not a question anybody asked. Mm -hmm. But if you trace that back, um, the place it gets you to is at the top of some mountains in Ethiopia. There's, there's two sources to the Nile. They're both high up in the mountains, far to the south. Mm. And that's where the water comes from because it rains a lot at a certain time of year. So why does it rain a lot at a certain time of year? And the reason is because of the ocean on the other side of it, mm. which is warm and has currents and the water from the Indian Ocean mm. evaporates, is carried over the land, mm. The rain is dumped at a time of year when the currents, you know, the wind's going that way, dumps a load of rain on the mountains, that trickles down and eventually becomes an inundation in ancient Egypt. And then you've got pyramids and mummified cats. Mm. And so the point is, you know, the ocean, the energy from the ocean is at the root of that. The energy from the ocean was is providing the water that, you know, is evaporating the water, providing the energy to the atmosphere. That's the water that moves across the mountains and ends up mm. fertilizing ancient Egypt. Mm. And so it, those sort of connections are everywhere. It, they're almost hard to see because they're so, you know, they're, they're like we don't, uh, we just go, oh, well, obviously there was an inundation in ancient Egypt. We don't ask why is the planet like mm -hmm. that? And when you go back down the chain of whys, it's quite often because of the ocean, because that's where the energy reservoir is. Mm. And that's the important bit. Mm, that's super fascinating. That, that, <laughs> it's, not, it's not something you're right that kind of we intuitively would, would kind of know. This is very, very fascinating. So tell us about the shape of water. So the question here is, um, is the shape of waves being active and not passive, the importance of wind, and the importance of gravity. So could you talk, I guess, about the shape of water and waves and how wind and gravity are implicated? So the the second uh, chapter of the book is, is about the shape of water because of the space that the ocean is in. And we think, you know, if you were talk, asking about the shape of the ocean, you might hear about mountain chains on the bottom and plate tectonics and all of that. Mm -hmm. And you might hear about the shallow coastal shelves. <clears throat> you don't hear much about the top. Mm -hmm. The top of the ocean does have a shape and it's got a shape for several reasons. Um, and the, the obvious one is that the wind blows across it and that pushes waves up. And if you keep pushing, if the wind gets faster and faster, um, gets fast enough, eventually those waves will start, they'll steepen and they'll start to break. Mm -hmm. And then you you kind of dump a load of you dump your energy in the ocean. That's where that, that's where the energy of the wind goes. Actually, generally, it's either friction with the ground, or it's it pushes on pushes on the ocean, and then that energy goes into waves, which get bigger and bigger. But when they break, that energy is dumped into the ocean. So so breaking waves are a kind of way of shifting energy from the atmosphere back into the surface ocean. Not very much, but you know it, it it's still it's useful for mixing things. So it does matter. Um, and, and waves, you know, so, so then there's, so that's, those are the waves we think about when we think about surfing, you know, if there's a big storm in the North Pacific, it might take a week or two for that. You, you generate enormous swell, really long, slow, huge waves that are, you'd barely notice them on the ocean out on the deep bits, you barely notice. And then as they come into the steep shores of somewhere like Hawaii, they kind of run out of space vertically. So they get they kind of get squished and they steepen and they become very big. And that's why the surfing in Hawaii, it's because of, that's the place where you get storms thousands of miles away in deep water mm. that produce the waves that then kind of get squished up mm. and will break mm. on the shores. Um, and so, so, that, so the waves are kind of the obvious ocean shape. But actually, if you do something quite clever, which is average all the waves out, and this is the sort of thing which you need satellites to do, and no one, I think, would have really thought of doing this until you do that. So if you measure with a satellite, satellite altimeters, they're called, so they measure distance to the ocean surface. And if you do that over a long period of time, you kind of average out all the little bumps, you get this average number. And even then the ocean's not flat. Um, it's mostly flat, 
I mean, you know, it's mostly follows the curvature of the earth, but it's not, it doesn't, it's not perfect. Um, and there's two reasons, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is that gravity is not uniform across the planet. So the water can just kind of go wherever it needs to go to, so that down is perpendicular to the surface, basically. Mm. So um, we tend to think of down being directly beneath us because we know that the surface, we think of the surface as horizontal and therefore down is perp you know, it's perpendicular to that, down to the centre of the earth. But if you've got a massive chunk of a really dense rock just to one side of you, down is actually like shunted over a little bit at a slight angle. Mm. So what does that do to the ocean? Well, it means the ocean has a hole in it. And I know that sounds silly, but there's a dip at the surface. Uh, or there's a bulge, for example, if something's pulling, if there's something, there's gravity that is pulling um, water towards it, there's a kind of bulge in the ocean there. And if there's a place where the, the, the water's been pulled away, mm -hmm. or there's just not very dense rock underneath, you, got, you get a hole. Mm. And just underneath the south tip of, southern tip of India, there's a, like the, the, the sort of average height of the ocean is 70 meters below where you would think it ought to be because the water's just been pulled away in other directions. Um, and actually, this is one of the things that influences, um, you know, potential sea level rise in the future. So Antarctica, you know, everyone's concerned about sea ice melting around Antarctica for good reason. The problem is not just that that's going to dump extra uh, water into the ocean, although that is a problem. It's that all that mass of water on Antarctica is huge. It's got a lot of gravity. It's pulling the ocean towards it. And so if you take that ice away, let it melt and run into the ocean, you also take away a bit of that gravitational pull and the water will kind of slump back and move into the rest of the global ocean. And you have to take that into account when you're considering future sea level rise. It's significant. So you get these weird lumps and bumps where gravity is kind of doing weird things, you know, just because the earth is not made of uniform rock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that makes gives lumps and bumps on the surface is that the water's moving. Um, and, um, and the reason that matters is that, uh, well, so, well, let's take, you know, there's lots of, there's a couple of things that are moving. Imagine a rotating storm, for example. So, you know, um, I live in, in London in the UK and quite our weather comes across the Atlantic from, you know, from New York, from around there. And so we get these big rotating storms, um, not hurricanes, but, you know, big things with an eye and a mm. sort of r round storm around the outside. And um, in the middle of them, they have quite low pressure, right? Mm. But, you know, it can be either way. It can be high or low, but let's go with low. Um, so you've got patch of the atmosphere, which is basically really low pressure. And what that means is the, the atmosphere is pushing down on the water more around the sides than it is in the middle. So the water bulges up in the middle. Mm. You can measure that in a storm. It can be 40 to 50 centimetres, mm. this kind of bulge of water that travels. You know, it's, it, the bulge moves, but the water doesn't travelling with the storm. And also if you get currents, you know, you can, um, water's moving along, the Coriolis force in the Northern Hemisphere will push it to the right and it'll kind of push it into a lump or a ridge. And you can measure those ridges. And that's the reason we can measure ocean currents from satellites is because we we know that the reason there's a, a lump or a ridge is because water is moving. And so we can look at the shape and size of the ridge and we can say, okay, well then if that's there, it must mean that water is moving, you know, by this much just to the south of it, for example. So, so the shape, you know, the ocean surface is quite, it does all these interesting things, which uh, maybe you wouldn't notice on a day-to-day -day level, but they, they do matter. Mm. Um, and yeah, but you would never, that's the era of satellites has brought that to us. Otherwise we would never be able to measure them. The gravity thing is still kind of blowing my mind. Um, I, I w kind of connected to it. Many people talk about the moon and the ocean tides. So you, and you talk about it in the book as well. Can you just, I'll just generally give you the question here, but what is accurate to say about the relationship of the moon with the ocean and could you explain a little bit of some of the misconception there, but why is this important to know for, for, for the ocean? Uh, well, the, the sort of quite fundamental reason is that the, the, the moon is giving the ocean energy. Mm. Um, so as, as uh, the moon goes round and round, it's actually drifting away ever so slightly. It's losing energy. So it's, its orbit is moving outwards 
drifting away from us. And we can measure this very, very slowly. We're not going to lose it anytime soon. <laughs> Um, so, so, th so energy from the moon's orbit is kind of moving into the tides and where that ends up is mixing the ocean. Mm. Um, now that all sounds a bit weird. There's a, there's a thing about tides, which people don't really, you don't, people don't really think about because we're all taught that thing. We're all given that diagram of the two <coughs> bulges on opposite yeah. sides of earth, right? Here's a tide moon's over there. Here's the earth. There's a bulge on the side facing the moon because the moon's pulling it towards it. There's a bulge on the other side because of centrifugal force. So it's kind of left behind mm -hmm. as the system spins around. Fine. But there are continents in the way. So that, that doesn't happen. <laughs> so you've got these, you know, the, 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 the water, this bulge of water just can't keep traveling across the planet because it, you know, it meets North America, which is not getting out of the way. <laughs> and so actually what happens with the tides is that in these basins, these big, deep places, water kind of sloshes around. You know, if you imagine um, taking a glass of water and, and sort of moving it in a, a circle, um, you know, the, 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 you'll see the upper edge of the water will kind of move around the outside of the glass. Basically, that's what happens in, mm. <laughs> in tidal, you know, in, in ocean basins and in places like the North Sea. So in the North Sea, it's got this place in the middle where basically the, the sea height doesn't change with the tide. But if you look around the outside, you can see this sloshing kind of going around the outside of the North Sea. Um, now, of course, it's driven by the moon, right? It's got the same, it, it have generally, it's a bit weird in some places, but it generally happens, you know, it changes four times a day, so you get two high tides a day. Um, so it's definitely driven by the moon, but it, it's more a sloshing than, you know, all the water moving one way and just keeping going around the planet. But the reason it matters for mixing is that when you drag water along, um, if you've got a rough a seabed, for example, or if you've got a mountain, mountain range, undersea mountain range that's kind of sticking up, um, as the tide drags water across it, you get a load of turbulence, you get mixing, and that's with the energy dump into the ocean. Sometimes you get internal waves, which are waves between the layers of the ocean. So, <laughs> so you're, and ultimately that becomes a little bit of heat. So you're dumping heat energy into the ocean. But it's really important for mixing the ocean up. Uh, and people who look at the total energy budget of the ocean, you know, this this is quite important um, in terms of how much those layers get mixed up. It turns out quite a lot of that happens via the moon. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, we all think about the tide as being, oh, well, you know, here I am at the beach having my ice cream and the tide's either going out or it's coming in, which is true. Mm. But actually, you know, the big story is out in the open ocean with these huge, this huge shunting around of energy mm. um, as the tides are kind of making the water in the basins slosh around. And of course, then it gets complicated in some places, mm. like, you know, where two of these basins, like the North Sea, one of them, you know, so I've, like we said, I've, I've been at sea in a lot of the world's oceans and the most horrible place I have ever been at sea was at <laughs> the bottom of the North Sea where the North Sea connects to the channel. Mm. So you've got... Um, Wind and you've got swell from the North Atlantic coming down, like down the east coast of Britain. And you've got swell from the channel coming up the other side. But you've also got the, you know, tides from two directions mm. making the wind, the waves really choppy. And the, the place where all of that meets is a horrible place to be on the ocean because everything's twisting, everything's coming from different directions. And, and I, I would take the North 10 meter waves in the middle of the North Atlantic over the North Sea with horrible twisting two meter waves mm. any day of the week. Mm. Because, you know, the complication makes it can be quite unpleasant to be on a boat floating about on top of it. Mm. <coughs> you, you also talk about the, how do I say this, the, the gy gyres? How, how do I say this? There's five ma main ocean gyres, is this right? Um, mm -hmm. And you say there's two in the North Atlantic and then the North Pacific. And then there's uh, south of the equator, there's three in the South Pacific, South Atlantic, and South Indian Oceans, all rotating anti-clockwise. And you give reasons for why um, they form and why they're important. And so could you talk about these five and, and why they're important for the ocean? So the gyres are kind of the big cogs in the engine. So the, the biggest and slowest part of the ocean engine is the overturning circulation, which is the bit where in a small number of places near close to the Arctic and the Antarctic, water does go down before it goes sideways. So, you, so you've got a small, and, and, that, and that, it goes down and then it slithers along and it very slowly comes up somewhere else. And that can take hundreds of years. So that, that's the slowest part of the ocean engine is 
overturning from the surface down to the bottom and back up again. But the next big component that sits on top of that are these gyres, these merry-go-rounds. And um, they're there because of the Coriolis effect. So the Coriolis effect is that thing where, you know, if people uh, played on a, you know, a roundabout carousel at, at school, um, you know, I remember, certainly remember doing this as a kid, like, kind of clinging on with my knees to one side of the roundabout with a friend on the other side and trying to throw a ball across, right, while the roundabout's going round and not fall off. And of course, it's hard because the roundabout's going round and you think you're throwing the ball straight, but actually it curves off to one side. <laughs> it does that because you're rotating. You know, the ball doesn't know it's supposed to be rotating with you. It's just traveling through the air. So if you're on a rotating surface, it looks like things get left behind. Mm. And so because the ocean is liquid, that matters quite a lot. So in the Northern Hemisphere, currents tend to bend to the right. And in the Southern Hemisphere, they tend to bend to the left. And so what that gives you is uh, gyres that go around clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere and counterclockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. So the water is moving and then it kind of gets pushed. But what's interesting is <coughs> it, it piles up. So this is one of the other ocean height things that... Um, you think, well, if it's going round and round in a circle, but it's being pushed inwards, then surely all the water will pile up in the middle. Oh. And it does. And it reaches this point where it can only pile up so far before it starts falling back down. And so you get this balance between the amount it's piled up and the amount it's fallen back down. Um, and then the, the, the water just goes around and around the outside of the hill, basically. And so that's what the big ocean gyres are. So they might rotate on timescales of um, a couple of years, I think. Um, and things get carried by them. Heat gets carried by them. Nutrients get carried by them. Um, animals get carried by them. So there are sea turtles, for example, that um, as, as babies, they will get carried somewhere by a gyre. And then as adults, they'll have to swim their way back. Mm. Um, the eel, the European eel, the, um, the very tiny larvae get carried by the Gulf Stream, which is part of the North Atlantic gyre towards the UK, you know, that I live right on the banks of the Thames. There's, there's European eels down there. They're endangered, but they are there. Yeah. So they, they come from the Sargasso Sea. They're carried by the top half of that gyre, um, which is the Gulf Stream. They come and live in Europe for a bit, up a river, and then they go back down and they sort of, sort of hitch a ride onto the other half of the gyre. Uh, well, it's not, we, we don't know very detailed in a lot of detail where they go, but they, they're then carried, they swim back across to the Sargasso Sea to breed. So, <laughs> so the gyres are these big kind of connecting cogs mm. that go round and round very slowly. And the interesting thing about the North Atlantic gyre is that we've, the, the Gulf Stream is famous because it's very fast and very warm mm. and very narrow. Mm. So it's kind of whizzing up the side of North America. But on the other side of that, that roundabout, that carousel, it's very slow. It does have a name. It's called the Canary Current. No one really pays any attention to it apart from oceanographers but it broadens out it's really wide it's really slow so it slows down and goes all the way around the uh, eastern side of the Atlantic and then it kind of turns before the equator and then it kind of goes across and then it starts to speed up and it whizzes around the top of the Gulf Stream and then it slows down and so this spreads out and so <coughs> these these gyres aren't uniform they're not just wheels going round they kind of change their character as they go hmm. Um, and that's quite important for the way the ocean works as well. Mm. Well, I have uh, two questions for you, two final questions. Um, I, I know you're, you're <laughs> I, I feel bad because I know you're, you're, you're a little under the weather. So <laughs> I'll, I'll give you two more. My voice is definitely a bit under the weather. But yeah. <laughs> so what we'll do is, so we, we've spent much of the time basically talking about the first part of the book. Uh, so this will be just a kind of, uh, sort of a preamble for people to go buy your book, which is great, and they can get all of you know the details of part one, which we've been talking about, and part two, where you talk about messengers, passengers, voyagers, which is great. So I just want to ask real quick before I get to my final question, just just briefly, um, deep water, the ocean floor, um, there's obviously so much we don't know in certain parts of the ocean. There's all of these bioluminescent creatures that are down there. There's I mean, I find the deep ocean like that at that level absolutely terrifying. Maybe for other people, it's exhilarating an adventure, but you give some cool stories in there about people that have gone down there. I mean, what what is there potentially, uh, you know, in the deep ocean at that at those depths that we're still learning about and understanding 
not only for the ocean, but really for the planet as a whole, uh, about what it's telling us about, about the ocean and the planet. Okay, well, the first thing is I'm going to have my rant about this phrase that is that we hear people say, um, and it's wrong, <laughs> and it's misleading, and I hate it. <laughs> and it's that thing where people say, we know more about the surface of the moon oh, than we know oh, about yes. the deep ocean. <laughs> yeah. And it's dreadful and awful and misleading <laughs> and terrible, and no one listening to this podcast should ever say it ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and the fundamental reason it's wrong and misleading is is it assumes that firstly it assumes they're comparable. It, you know, the moon is very nice. I have nothing against the moon, but it's a piece of dead rock that literally hasn't changed for two billion years. Um, whereas the ocean is three-dimensional, it's doing all these things, it's full of life, it's full of interesting geology, it changes seasonally, there's loads going on. There is so much more to know. And and the, that comparison um basically makes it sound as though the deep ocean is like the moon, that it's like this piece of dead rock, which is just sitting there, not doing anything. And that is wrong. <laughs> we should not ever say this phrase. But the other thing is that <laughs> it's kind of insulting to the thousands of ocean scientists who spent their careers measuring and, mm -hmm. and studying the deep ocean, right? You know, 12 people have been to the moon. Hundreds have mm. been to the, to the seafloor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even the deepest, if you, I can't remember the exact numbers, but if you go down to... But I think the number of people that have been below, at or below the average depth of the seafloor is well into the hundreds. Mm. So it sort of implies that all those people weren't doing anything. There's so much more to know about the ocean. So it's completely not comparable. And so um, the first thing is we, we, there are a lot of things we don't know about the deep ocean, but at the same time, there are a lot of things we do know. Like we can't claim ignorance here. We mm. can't just go, oh, look at this big convenient, mm. you know, mystery um, and I think people do it because we're, we're taught as, we're, if you look at the way our culture works in the Western world, it's based on the idea of discovering the unseen. Mm -hmm. But the unseen means something very limited. It means um, the shape of something. Mm -hmm. And there is more to life than the shape of something. It's the processes that matter. Yeah. And so there are very, like the moon's very nice, very few processes. Mm -hmm. It's just sitting there. The ocean is doing things all the time. So, <laughs> you know, our definition of exploration now has to be about processes. It has to be about humility and sitting in a place where we think we know what's going on and watching nature prove us wrong. That's what exploration should be. So in terms of what we know about the deep ocean, um, what we don't know, there are very deep parts of the, you know, the deep ocean um, where there is life that lives very slowly. It's very dark. It gets very little food, but it's completely weird. It lives in, in ways that we don't really understand. And part of the reason we don't understand it is, firstly, we can't keep them alive if we bring them back to the surface. You know, we're talking six kilometers down mm -hmm. in the Clarion Clipperton zone. Um, it just it just doesn't stay alive. You know, you can't just put it in a tank and go, oh, I wonder what it's eating today. Mm -hmm. um, and the second reason, and, and of course, it's inaccessible because it's a very long way down. Um, and the second thing is that um, it lives very slowly. Mm. So you need a huge amount of patience. It's no good just watching it for a year. Mm. You have to sit and watch for a very, very, very long time to find out what it's doing. And so, <laughs> and of course, these are the regions that are threatened by the idea of deep sea mining, mm -hmm. uh, which we don't need and which would be mindless destruction of something we don't understand. And so I think when it comes to the deep ocean, Really, it is the last great untouched wilderness yeah. by human hands. You know, we've, we've been to Antarctica, you know, not many people, but we can walk across it. Enough people go there, it's accessible. The deep ocean is the place, the really deep ocean, where no human has stood. And so I think the, the, big, the biggest lesson that, it, you know, there's lots of things we don't know about the ocean, but the biggest thing we don't know about the deep ocean is whether we can leave it alone. Mm. Because every single new place humanity has ever discovered it's, you know, we have sort of, uh, you know, bulldozed right through it and then regretted it afterwards. Oh dear, look at that species. It just went extinct. Oh dear, it happened. That forest was providing lots of oxygen. Oh dear, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe this time we can learn that we should just let it be and understand it before we decide whether to, we should take anything from it. Mm. So I think that's the biggest thing we don't know about the deep ocean. It's whether we can leave it alone. Mm. And that's up to us. Well, it sort of leads me to my last question, which is obviously the planet is changing and it's changing rapidly. There was a, a wonderful uh, 
footnote that you had in uh, the last chapter of the book. You talk about all the different changes that are happening from climate change. Um, and you, you give an overview and you, and you say uh, it's a short list of some problems, which are gigantic loss of coral reefs to bleaching, the release of toxic chemicals into ocean ecosystems, bioaccumulation of toxic additions like mercury, Invasive species mucking up ecosystems, massive bycatch by fishing industry and illegal fishing, marine mammals being hit by ship propellers, massive ice loss in polar regions, dumping of human waste, fish farming, ocean infrastructure, obviously ocean acidification. That's a that's a lot of problems. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of problems for the ocean, uh, and that's not even an exhaustive list. Uh, you know, when we look at the future of the ocean. And how much we've done a lot of harm to it with those problems and many more that aren't listed. What do we do? I mean, what, how do we, how do we fix that or stop that? How do we, uh, what is the future, I guess, of, of the ocean? So the first thing is that the book is written in a very specific way, which is that most of the book is talking about how the ocean works. And it's because it's, it's impossible to talk about how something is changing in any meaningful way unless you know what it is to start with. So, so I think it's really important that we actually look at what the ocean is to start with. And then all of these things make a lot more sense. Mm. Um, so, but when it comes to the future of the ocean, um, n- n- there's two things that are going to make a difference. There's knowledge and a bit of humility. But part of that knowledge is not just the scientific knowledge mm. and the way we should look at it, but it's understanding our own relationship with the ocean. Mm. Because it's not this big thing out there that is just over there. It's not this place called away that everyone seems to think exists. It's part of us. It's part of our planet. We're we're part of the environment it creates. And so (laughs) once you understand that, once you understand how the ocean works and and why it matters so much, you see your relationship to it differently. And that means you will make decisions differently. Because at the moment, we don't prioritize the ocean. We just treat it as a way. So there is no doubt that the ocean is um, changing in ways we can measure. A lot of you know, those changes are not good. Um, but the very important thing is we can do something about this. I think overall, I hope people see this as a positive book because once you understand what the deal is, you can see how to make a difference. It's not just like a shopping list of, oh, I must remember yeah. to do this today. Mm-hmm. You actually understand the relationship with the ocean that you have. And so I think... I am optimistic because, well, firstly, I'm optimistic because, you know, along with lots of other scientific topics I've been talking about for years, I've been trying to talk about the ocean for 10 years and no one's been ready to listen. Like people go, oh, no, I'll go to my 37th lecture on astronomy (laughs) and hear some more about some stars I'll never touch rather than go to one lecture about the ocean and actually learn something new because nobody knew there was anything to learn that wasn't about fish. Mm. And that's starting to change. Mm. So (laughs) the, the ocean is definitely rising up the agenda in terms of people being aware that there is something to know, mm. but they just don't really know what it is yet. Um, so I think the, the framing of how we talk about it is, is really important. But actually, you know, there are serious problems that I absolutely do not want to underplay, but we can improve all of them if we think about how we live on the planet. And, and I think a lot of the challenge for, the, you know, for human civilization for the next few years is to really understand but what the game here is, is not what we were always told it was, which is, you know, to go across the landscape and take. It's that we have to observe how the planet works and then be creative about how we can fit in with it without damaging the things that are already happening. Because the great misconception everyone's got about the ocean, I think most of the time, is that it's not doing anything of any value. So when people go, oh, well, we're just going to put an oil rig in here. We're just going to take some minerals from the seafloor. We're just going to take some fish out or we're just going to, you know, we're just, I hate the word just, as you might be gathering, <laughs> but um, it's, it's, it completely obscures the very necessary fact that the ocean is already doing things that benefit mm. us. And maybe if we're clever and if we really understand what we're doing, we can add a little bit of infrastructure into the ocean in a way that, you know, takes away a little bit of energy, for example, without destroying what the ocean is already doing for us in that place. Mm. And that's the game. It's to understand the planet well enough to fit in with it. And this is a fascinating and creative and interesting challenge, but it is not the way progress has been presented to us, Mm. to most of us up to this point. So (laughs) 
you know, and the biggest threat to the ocean is climate change. Mm -hmm. If you want to protect the ocean, decarbonize as quickly as possible, end off, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> oh, and stop eating endangered fish or octopus. Mm -hmm. um, but so, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the increasing amount of awareness of the ocean. But the most important thing we can do is to talk about the ocean as though it's part of our world and not separate to it and learn, really learn about how it works. Mm. And those are the things that are going to make it much easier to make good decisions in the future. So I am worried, but I also think this is actually the point where I'm starting to see a change and we can stop a lot of these problems getting worse and every single little thing we can do is going to matter and it's going to make a difference and we shouldn't lose hope because we really can do a much better job than we're doing. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very wonderful. Well, the book is called The Blue Machine, How the Ocean Works. Uh, it's out uh, everywhere now. And um, yeah, uh, people should absolutely pick it up. Uh, there's a lot we didn't touch on, and I, I really hope listeners uh, pick it up and read it. Um, where's the best places to, to find you, or where's the places you want to point people to, if any, uh, at all? Oh, what if they're interested in my work in general? Yeah, yeah. Any of your um, research or any, oh, well, any organizations or anything that you want to point people to? Uh, so I'm on most social media that isn't Twitter or X. <laughs> um, so you can find me on any of those. Um, I've got a website, helencharisky.net. And uh, my academic webpage is at University College London. Mm. So you can search my mm. name and find it there. And I do, I mean, I do lots of other things. I, I write and present mm. and um, there's always interesting things going mm. on. Mm. Um, and the next one actually is I'll be going to see to the North Atlantic, back to the North Atlantic in November and December this year. So there'll probably be some blogs and videos mm. and things associated nice. with that. Very, very nice. Well, Helen, I, I appreciate you giving me your your time and your energy, even though you, you've uh, you've had a little bit of a cough. So I, I appreciate that. This was uh, such a, a joy and a pleasure to, to talk with you about your work that you're passionate about. I, I really got a lot out of it. It's a very valuable conversation and I'm, uh, I'm very, very, very thankful. Well, thank you for inviting me and thanks for being enthusiastic about the book. Spread the word, spread the ocean love. <laughs> awesome, thank you.